and have a successful test run with the first ever human is pretty remarkable. And I think it's such, such a good use case of AI. You know, we were talking about education in a couple episodes ago, one or two episodes ago, where ASU partnered with OpenAI. To You're listening to Future Tense, the AI show that demystifies the world of artificial intelligence and tells you what you need to know. Join Jeff Joyce and Julia McCoy live right now. Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome to Future Tense. I'm Jeff Joyce. And I'm Julia McCoy. Thank you so much for being here and listening to us. We've got a killer show for you today. Cool. We have a lot of topics. And I'm going to go ahead and let Julia kick off on the main topic. We're super excited to talk about this one. And it has to do with Neuralink. Julia, oh, you want to go ahead and kick that off? Yes, yes. Well, it's crazy because, you know, we just doubled our recording time to twice a week. And I was, um, I was like, hmm, well, we have enough to fill the doc that we're working on that we, we do constant research, Jeff and I, on all things AI, the news, we filter it for you. And I'm telling you, like, not only do we have more than enough to talk about, but we actually have competing headlines. So for today, Jeff and I like did an internal vote, which one's the craziest? And we believe this one is. So in breaking news, NAI, on Sunday, this is, let's see, it's January 30th, Tuesday, we're recording this. So this was Sunday, January 28th. The first ever AI chip was implanted into a patient's brain successfully. And this is by Elon Musk's company called Neuralink. So the first ever human patient received an implant from that brain chip startup and is recovering well, so it was successful. And something that Jeff and I were talking before we jumped on recording here was the history of Elon Musk's company. So Neuralink has over 400 employees and they've raised, I think it's 300 million in startup funding. And something they've done are just insane amounts of tests. Um, yeah, they have more, under, more than 400 employees and they've raised over 363 million. And so Jeff, will you speak to the tests they've done? You were telling me on primals, so animals, they've done a lot of testing there. Yeah, they've done a ton of tests. Uh, I was watching a video a while back of they had a primate that was attached to a tube, but the tube was just a feeding tube to elicit the interaction between the interface it's interacting with, which is, which I believe it was Pong at the time, but they have a ton of different tests that they've done with actually controlling oh, there it is right there <laughs> you can see it on the screen but yeah it's it's a it's a monkey basically uh it looks like it's doing stuff with its hands but it's actually controlling um the interface mm -hmm. with its brain um so they're eliciting that reaction by feeding the uh ape the chimp i can't i don't know what type of monkey that is unfortunately <laughs> um but they'll, they'll, they'll feed it and they'll kind of train it to complete a task which in that case it was playing pong but they can have it do all sorts of different things whether it's typing whether it's like that but what really gets this really interesting is the ways that they can take that, that technology and kind of uh, fix issues that we have within our body and i think that you probably want to tackle on take that or talk about that julia where yeah. they're talking about preparing people to have uh disabilities with vision with their limbs and stuff like that yes yes and um you know going back a couple weeks ago i think you jeff and i we were talking about this and how i was like completely anti just dropping ai in a functional human body i'm like why are we messing with something that's already created to be nearly perfect because that's what we can achieve in our human state is amazing health and an amazing level of well-being without the need for an implant. And so I was like, mm, I would try to do this. So what I love actually about Neuralink and Elon Musk's mission with this is he says that his mission is to help people who have spinal cord injuries, ALS, quadriplegia. So they can't use their limbs. And that's the primary reason why Neuralink was invented and created. And Elon Musk has been on stage saying this. In fact, the first Neuralink product is called telepathy. And in the first use case, and this is true of the first patient, is just for people who have lost the ability to use their limbs. And I love what Elon Musk said is his ideal use case. <laughs> he said, imagine if Stephen Hawking could communicate faster 
than a speed typist or auctioneer. <laughs> That's the goal. So here's Elon Musk looking at people who can't even use their limbs and asking, how do we make them 10 times better than the person who can already do this? And that is like taking the human limitation and pushing it to the umpteenth level, which I am a huge fan of. You know, I look at documentaries all the time that show people have pushed themselves to the limits in a sport, in a race, in a swim competition. And I'm just so inspired by those stories because they portray what's possible if we remove often our own self-made limitations. And so for Elon Musk to take people who can't use their limbs, put this inside their brain and have a successful test run with the first ever human is pretty remarkable. And I think it's such such a good use case of AI. You know, we were talking about education in a couple episodes ago, in one or two episodes ago, where ASU partnered with OpenAI, took their enterprise license, gave it to 5,000 instructors on campus. That's an amazing use case because they're taking that and they're giving the power to the instructor saying, go create ChatGPT bot-like instructors. Go have these extremely intelligent AI bots train your class. And that's such a great use case because it pairs up the human in the right place with AI where we can literally become 10x, 20x with AI. And so that's what Elon Musk is doing with Neuralink. And you know what's interesting is how this is actually done. So I'm going to share a story from QZ, but <laughs> how the surgery is actually done is to integrate this chip. So it's a physical chip with electrical wires that implant directly into the brain. <laughs> that sounds, mm. so anyway, the first step is a human surgeon is actually the, the being <laughs> that cuts the hole into the skull. So they have to open up the skull. And then there's a seven foot tall robot named R1 that takes over. <laughs> and that robot actually installs the implant into the brain. So that is what was successful Sunday. And by the way, Musk has a whole term for this. <laughs> he calls it transhumanist brain hacking. And, you know, going back to what I said at the beginning, the reason I love this is he's taking people that wouldn't have opportunities that they now have because they can use their limbs again, arguably even better than a normal functioning person. So I love that he's equipping a human who otherwise couldn't achieve these levels without AI. And that's such a great use case. Oh yeah. I, it's such a, a, a noble pursuit for that. I think that restoring people with disabilities, especially like it, 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 for me, like vision, if I lost my eyes, if I wasn't able to see that would impact me on a level that I can't even comprehend, like from consuming media to just living my everyday life, to be able to restore that in somebody, I can't imagine like, just how incredible of a feeling that would be. Um, and I wanted yeah. to share a post from uh, somebody on LinkedIn named Steve Nori. Let me go ahead and share screen here. And uh, by the way, Julie and I have been heavy on LinkedIn lately. If you're not, if you're on LinkedIn, make sure that you uh, follow us. I'm at uh, Jeff Joyce on LinkedIn. Julia, what's your handle on LinkedIn? Julia McCoy. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So he says. Uh, breaking Neuralink has implanted its first ever brain chip into human. And he asks, is this the ultimate UI? And from a, if you think about it from a UI perspective of like interacting with things, it's really, really interesting to be able to think about how you would normally interact with the computer or your phone and how that would change with a brain implant. So the normal things that you would do, let me go ahead and mute this. This instance, it talks about playing games, interacting with your phone, but just interacting with any piece of technology only using your brain is a very fascinating concept where you no longer need a mouse, you no longer need a keyboard, and you don't even need to really talk to it in order for it to complete an action. You would just think it, and then it would do it. That is highly fascinating to me. And I think that as we start to see this kind of refine, we could start to see this be not just an implant, but have it be something that we just wear on our heads. Um, let me make sure that you guys can see. Do you see the Morpheus article, Julia? Yeah. Yes, Perfect. yeah. So there's a new piece of techn technology that was uh, announced um, 
is an AI model called Morpheus One, and it claims to induce lucid dreaming. And this is the device right here. Let me see if I can increase the size. But it's basically just a headband that you wear while going to sleep, and it supposedly helps you induce lucid dreaming. Um, so it's fascinating to see that these companies are going in a direction where it's not just a something that you implant into your brain, but also something that you can just wear outside of your skull <laughs> that just place on your head and you start to use it. And that opens up a whole different avenue of how you interact with the technology that's way less invasive. Now, granted, you'll still need procedures, which is why the Neuralink is so important to where if you have these problems where you're in, unable to walk, where you're paraplegic, where you're, you're blind, um, for that technology is still vitally important. But I do see a future where we have just a wearable piece of technology where you rest on your head, or maybe maybe they get it into a form of, of you know sunglasses or just normal reading glasses to where that then becomes a brain interface as well. Not only really sure if that's even possible, but it's interesting to take it in that direction and see what's what could be possible in the future. Incredible. I like how the on the article you were sharing, Morpheus was named after um, a figure in literal fiction. So it was named after a Greek god that had meaning for that. I love how, you know, it's like we take all these dreams we actually had. I remember what you said, Jeff, you know, you're fascinated by the idea of using your brain to literally control your physical outcome. I remember at seven years old, and this will age me, so you'll know how not old I am. I'm just kidding. I hear that anyone born in the 90s is now old. I reject that. That's not correct. Uh, it's actually the, the 1900s. <laughs> born in the 1900s. I hate that. <laughs> oh, my God. That is technically true. But it's like, no, 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 no. The 90s is not the 1900s. Anyway, I <laughs> Back in, I want to say, 98, I was seven years old. And I saw the 56K modem connect to the internet for the first time. And it was like just amazing. It felt like magic. You know, I was watching us be able to connect and chat with somebody that was a whole globe over, like across the globe in another country. That was the technician. <laughs> um, so, but it was just magical. And I remember thinking the next day, it was actually in my mind, what if we could interact with our computers through our brain? And I've carried that thought ever since I saw how the internet worked, because to me, that's like, just an incredible evolution of what we could do with work capabilities. Because if you think about it, we're kind of trapped at the desk and at our computers because we have to get stuff done. But what if we didn't have to, and this takes some imagination. What if we didn't have to sit here and type and work and we could literally just like go on a walk, interact with our AI, tell it what to do, deploy the email campaign, deploy the content, use content of scale to turn that episode into a blog. And you're not actually at your desk doing anything. That to me is like the next evolution. Um, because if you study philosophy and <laughs> a lot of like Socrates, great minds like that, you see this idea presented in history of being, not doing. And I love that idea because what it means is that it, puts the human in the place they were always meant to be. We're called human beings, not human doings. And so what if work was the evolution of us to become our best selves where we are just being? And that's my philanthropy box for the day. <laughs> philanthropy <laughs> box, I mean. <laughs> no, that's that's very interesting. And it leads me into a thought process. Uh, it, it's also something that I heard Elon Musk talk about. Uh, there's two different versions of this neural link that we have to think about. One is kind of this, the stimulation of like the, like the optic nerve, the stimulation of the parts of your, of your spine and your, and your brain that actually control movement. But it's also can stimulate things like information input to where we can also feed stuff through your optic nerve to where you actually can see mental images of things that you can possibly interact with. So imagine that you have a computer in front of you and you're like, well, I'm gonna walk away from a computer, but you can still have a mental picture of your screen fed to you by Neuralink. Then you take that step up step further. What if you wanted to know a piece of information? You would go to Google, you do the search, or if you could just think that instantly, you just thought like, yeah. I wanna know this, and then you can access all that information and have it fed to your brain. So 
whether or not that's achievable, we'll have they'll have to continue to test. But those are that's kind of the direction that that's headed. It's where you, you're no longer reliant to carry around a device or sit down at a at a at a desk in order to do anything. Uh, you can just do it all in your head. And at that point, you truly become free from any tether that you have that keeps you, you know, stationary or that impedes you from completing a task. You just think what you want done and it's, you do, it does it. So that's a really, really cool avenue to go down with Neuralink. And I really hope that they actually achieve that. And also the Morpheus thing is cool too. Like if I just wore a headband and can interact, interact with everything, that would be awesome. Yes. And that's where I'm really interested in as a potential user of this. I personally would not want a chip in my brain. I would just like reject that. I would run away. <laughs> and it's funny because I early on, whenever I joined Continent Scale, that was one of the use cases I learned about because over in Europe, they were actually legalizing it last January. They were taking a Petri dish and I think it was 80,000 stem cells and passing a law that allowed Elon Musk to implant with those brain cells over in Europe. So once that became a possibility, the conversations all started around, well, is this even something we should be doing? And the moral dilemma came up. And it was interesting because I didn't share my opinion. I just posted about it and was like, would you want a brain implant? Would you want to become like 10x with AI? But it would take like you on the surgery table, allowing it to be implanted into your brain. What's your answer? And so it was so much division. It was hilarious. And there is, uh, <laughs> I thought this was the funniest part. There was a pastor that said, yeah, I probably finally remember my sermons better. <laughs> it's like the, the level of people's <laughs> reactions to this. I think it's really interesting to gauge, but going back to Neuralink, I think the use case for that to allow people to actually use their limbs again, to allow these brilliant people like Stephen Hawking to be able to do more with their limbs and things they couldn't do because of paraplegia is just, that's a remarkable use case. And I'm excited to see that come to life. So there, there was one tiny caveat and you kind of, you kind of touched on it, which was, and actually I commented this on, on Steve's post on LinkedIn is I wonder about the ethical and privacy considerations of such an advanced technology. So when you think about your brain always being connected to an AI, there is no sense of privacy at that point, especially if it achieves like stage two or it's able to then read thoughts, go back and pass information back and forth. Your entire life is no longer private. It's essentially interacting with servers and computers. And that becomes an issue of like, you have to really nail security, <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, all your thoughts just out for display. Anybody can can access them. Like th that type of scary, like doomsday aspect of it is kind of a concern. But I think that it's not enough to completely impede the progress. Would be like to stop people from from actually wanting this technology. Should it achieve that in the future? Yes. Yeah, it'll be really interesting to see now that the first successful human trial and we have a patient actually recovering as of three days ago. It'll be interesting to see where this goes. But if we're moving on, we move on to the next headline here. Um, do we want to cover the city that's cloning itself with AI? What do you think, Jeff? Absolutely. I think that's really, really interesting. It's really interesting. I agree. Well, I am going to share this article um, by Financial Times, which is really, they cover it so well. Um, <laughs> the headline, gotta love the headline, A Tale of Two Cities. Hmm. <laughs> Charles Dickens fans. All right, so the story is that Barcelona is actually creating an AI clone of itself. They're in the middle of doing that. So they're collecting real-time data from sensors around the city. They're having a computer understand those sensors and then they're analyzing and predicting traffic and energy use. So they're using machine learning and AI to do this. And what's interesting, when you look at Barcelona, oh my gosh. So in December, they launched the latest version of a supercomputer called Mare Nostrum 5, which has the ability to perform 314 million billion calculations per second. And they actually took the supercomputer which came out in December a month ago. I mean, we're living in the future. 
what's funny is they took this, they took this computer, oh my God, and they put it inside of a chapel. Oh, man. <laughs> so it's like where people used to go to church, you now go to a computer. Oh my gosh. Barcelona, what are you doing? But anyway, so the supercomputer is part of the reason for the possibility of this. And this thing is, it's, it's a thing now called digital city building. And in Barcelona and places near Barcelona, it's become a legitimate part of urban planning. So these European cities are basically exploring how to get more efficient, sharper, faster, cleaner, and greener. So the news article says, so what they can do in real life or what they can take from real life is basically a rendering of a second time in a digital space. So they can take the current and then project the future and test ways to make the city more efficient, safer, better, cleaner in that virtual city. And this is... That image is wild. <laughs> the Mare Nostrum supercomputer in the church. What the heck? This looks straight out of an apocalyptic... Uh, it, they definitely have a sense of humor. And... <laughs> It's funny because like the the simulation theory of like we live inside of a simulation and that like yeah simulation is like a form of of God so to speak um, and just the, the placement of it being inside of a church just you you could tell that what they're going for it's definitely a shock factor a hundred percent. And look how pretty this is constructed for you audio listeners. Like we're looking at this giant glass wall that's been installed inside of a cathedral-like church. And inside that glass wall are these very tall next level computers. Have you ever seen Ready Player One? Did you see that movie, Jeff? Absolutely. Great oh, movie. <laughs> Great movie. Yeah, this reminds me of uh, some of the scenes straight out of Ready Player One. What the heck is going on here? That's wild. Yeah, it's... <laughs> it's something to see for sure. If you're an audio listener, I definitely recommend checking out the video uh, version of this so you can see that image. It's it's very it's like, well, it's surreal, I should say. Yes, it's crazy. And so this project where they're cloning the city, they've recorded 60 buildings already. And it's under the name hashtag Save Ukrainian Heritage. Um, so, so it's interesting because <laughs> one of the goals is to help Ukrainian churches keep their heritage <laughs> hmm. by installing a supercomputer right in the church. Okay. That's how we're going to preserve the heritage. Oh my gosh. But it's wild to see what's possible through what they're doing. They're producing these 3d models that are just, they weren't possible until the supercomputer and AI collectively came out and Jeff, like we got to do a whole episode on that. And I want to, like for those of you listening, I want to approach that topic with care um, because I think there's just, you know, we've said this in several episodes, there's so much opportunity to just freak out and go, oh my gosh, I'm not going to have income. I'm not going to have a job because <laughs> the robots and Skynet are going to take everything. And if you study what's coming with supercomputing, quantum mechanics and AI, it's pretty insane what AI will be able to do. I think the question will be, what can AI not do? And what it cannot do is going to be very, very little. And what it will not do better than a human could be nothing. So when we're there, the world's going to change completely. But don't freak out. You know, I think the best advice, Jeff, I'd love to hear what you would say. For me, the best advice would be do what you're doing right now. Like keep doing it. Like let's say you're an expert. You're an expert coach. You help people build businesses without burnout, or you're a career coach, or you're a marketing agency, or you teach people how to build an agency, you name it, whatever you do as an entrepreneur, creator, builder, learn how to use AI in what you teach, do or serve. That is the best way you could prepare for this right now, not freaking out, not shutting down your company doors. I mean, you could sell an exit like I did. <laughs> <laughs> Try to work only in AI. I highly recommend that approach. 
But that's the best way to go forward is not to let fear take over. Remember what fear stands for. I love the acronym approach to fear, false evidence appearing real. And oftentimes that's exactly what fear is because the opportunity is so much greater right now than the actual loss from what fear could drive you to. So if you think about it that way, the opportunity is huge, huge. So don't freak out that all this is coming and it's coming at us fast. Jeff, would you add anything to that? Yeah, I think that you have to keep in mind that AI is a tool and ultimately it's a companion to you. It's an augment to whatever you're putting out. And the creativity side of it is looking for ways where you fit in with that tool and how you use it to best leverage it. Um, when you look at all these things, they they seem scary, but are they actually practical, like in real world usage right now? Not really. There's a lot of these uh, things like this, um, this simulated city where sure, like they, they envision a practical usage, but they're not there yet. Now they can use that to make an, a, a decision based off that information, but that's still a tool. So it's not really re replacing anybody. And this idea of replacement is what I think scares a lot of people, but it's not really a replacement. It's a reskilling process where if you have a certain set of skills, you're reskilling with the inclusion of AI into whatever you're doing. So it's not something that you should be really afraid of, but it shows something you should be aware of and you should prepare and educate yourself on AI to then use it to its maximum potential to just you know 10X, 20X your output or your quality and focus on that aspect of it. And of course, we'll keep you updated with the news, with everything that comes out with AI, but it's always going to be through that lens of how can you best use this technology to the improve your life, your work, your happiness, everything. So that's what I would add. Yeah. Love that. And that actually leads into something else that I had here, which was interesting. It's kind of the, I'll say it's the contrarian opinion to the study that came out this January from 20. 2200 odd some AI researchers saying that all human work will be automated. It's just a matter of time. And this headline from a very legitimate resource, MIT, MIT Sloan, IBM Institute for Business Value, they did some research. And now keep in mind, these are predictions, right? And so I would take it with a grain of salt. But what these MIT researchers found was that the belief out there among employers is um, that 23% of wages paid for tasks involving vision are viable for AI automation. So it's only economically sensible to replace human labor with AI in one fourth of the jobs where vision is a big component. And this actually lines up with a study that I found last August that came out like, by IBM and other legitimate resources where they looked at executives, I think it was 2000 across 22 countries, and what they found among these executives was a prediction and a belief that AI would not replace, but it would augment their workforce. And so what's interesting are, you know, the founder, the CEO of Anthropic said this, the human using AI will replace the human not using AI. So that's the concern, not will I get replaced? It's do I have a counterpart out there doing what I'm doing, but 10 times faster with AI? <laughs> Well, what do you think the employer is going to want on their team? <laughs> the 10x faster human that's been super humanified, so to speak, with AI. So that's how we need to think here because employers are already thinking like that. They're looking for the potential employee team member that is using AI to augment everything. And there's a YouTube video that just came out with this study uh, we're looking at it right here on MIT CSAIL, but you can also find it on YouTube right here, the MIT professor on AI's future. And what he says, it's very, very technical. So for me, it's not very technical, but more abstract, creative thinker. It's kind of hard for me to sit there and listen to the whole thing. But it's very good if you want a very technical, like dry breakdown of the gradual integration of AI into sectors and what these principal inve investigators at MIT are actually saying when it comes to computer vision and technological industries where AI could have a lot of impact. So it's all about augmentation, not replacement. But, you know, if you think about it, like even our 
content team, Jeff, and I know you'll share more in a podcast episode coming up about what we've done, but just through our own technology, we've taken a content marketing and this goal of a million uniques per month. And we've broken that down into, okay, we're going to get content out. We're going to get however many blogs out per month for us. It's 70 to 90, anywhere between that. We're going to do all with one writer. So who is that one writer? It's not the writer doing it manually because <laughs> they aren't going to get it done. <laughs> it's going to be the writer using content scale. So that whole approach of like the AIO writer using AI to get your research and your work done just so much faster. And what's interesting is there's this huge breakthrough in AI, right? Where last year uh, when GPT models got better and better and these LLMs had a huge breakthrough, the AI researchers and experts and thought leaders all said, we thought this would take another 50 years. And so what I think we're going to see in front of us is the compression of time and the incredible um, just collapses of human automa uh, human manual work that we didn't want to do anyway. We're just going to see that collapse fully. And AI is going to just eat up technological advances faster than we ever thought possible because one breakthrough leads to another, right? And then there's competition for that breakthrough. And that's what we're seeing right now in companies that are the brightest minds in the world. So it's going to be really interesting to see how quickly all this moves forward. I think it's just a matter of months and years, not decades. Well said. And with that, I want to go ahead and kind of give people a heads up on the, oh, kind of the future I episodes. You, uh oh. Hopefully it's <laughs> not just me. Let me see here. I still cannot hear you. Uh oh. Uh oh. Oh, it's showing for me. Try now. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. That okay. Was perfect. Oh my God. <laughs> Sorry for the podcast. All right. <laughs> I, um, so I said, uh, very good points. And with that, I kind of want to give people a rundown of what the next two weeks of episodes go are going to be because we're going to be kind of traveling, moving, all sorts of stuff. And so um, uh, this Thursday, Julia will not be with us. I'll be doing a the show by myself, unfortunately. Ugh. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, but it will be half news, half a presentation. Uh, I will try to make the presentation as valuable as possible, but also uh, make sure that the audio listeners are able to actually follow along. Um, the following week after that, um, for the Tuesday episode, I think we should be good, right? I and, believe so. I mean, I may be then, coming to you from an unknown location. Mm -hmm. And then <laughs> the the Thursday episode will probably have to do, we'll probably have to not do it live and film it Wednesday. And mm -hmm. then post it Thursday. That probably will be what we have to do for that one. That's true. Because we'll be together in person in Austin. I'm speaking at a college in Austin on that Thursday. Yeah. So, but so, expect good content. There you go. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but that is uh, the next couple of weeks uh, worth of uh, podcast episodes. But I hope that you enjoyed all of everything we talked about today. Uh, I know that the Neuralink one is a little bit of a shocker to everybody that they're actually in the human trials, but yeah. Anything would you like to add, Julia? Well, um, <laughs> would we like to end on another sarcastic sponsor read? Would love to. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm a little offended that AI said this about a device I personally love. Um, so just putting that out there, here it goes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Written 100% by AI. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and all you overworked content creators out there, it's time to throw your typewriters out the window. Don't, no, no. Why? Because today's sponsor is Content at Scale, the tool that's revolutionizing laziness in content. <laughs> <laughs> laziness in content creation. Imagine a world <clears throat> where you don't have to lift a finger to write. No more writer's block, no more carpal tunnel from typing, and definitely no more crying into your coffee because you can't think of a catchy intro. Content Scale is here to save your day, your night, and your sanity. <laughs> Here's a little secret. <clears throat> Content Scale is like that group project member who does all the work while you take all the credit. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> it's so human-like in its writing that you'll start wondering if it's secretly stealing your diary to learn from the best. That's you, obviously. But be warned, this tool does everything, research, formatting, SEO, and it even publishes the content directly from the app. By the way, yes, it does all that, contentascale.ai. It's so efficient, it's kind of scary. You might find yourself with so much free time that you have to actually, I don't know, talk to people? Yikes. And let's not forget, Consonant Scale is probably plotting to take over the world one, one blog post at a time. But until then, you can use it to dominate the internet with top-notch content while you kick back, relax, and bask in the glory of doing absolutely nothing. So if you're ready to embrace your inner lazy genius, hop on over to content at scale. Now, let's get back to our show, which I definitely, totally, absolutely did not use AI to script. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That ending is great. <laughs> I, oh I saw a lot of uh, videos and stuff like that. Like, I think it was like two years ago, talking about uh, how to be a, an effective, lazy content creator and how they make the best creators because they kind of look for shortcuts. And this is, I think, true for like every industry. It's like somebody that's really lazy will look for ways to shortcut, but still get the work done. And it's like the, the people will intentionally hire lazy people. I think there's probably like diminishing returns on that to where it's like if they're too lazy, you know. But I think that with AI, it's really funny that they, that it kind of pieced those together. That's hilarious. I mean, it's kind of... I think it garbled the thought. Like what I've seen Constant Scale do is augment incredibly smart people, augment their workload and reduce it by half so they can go out and be even smarter and better at other things. So the message predominantly of encouraging laziness is not <laughs> something I get behind. <laughs> not at all. Be a better member of society. Thanks to Constant Scale. <laughs> <laughs> That's a better message. But right. what you said, Jeff, it's like the, I think the best way I've seen that translate is simple is not easy, but simple is how you achieve results. Because a lot of people, myself included, we tend to overthink, we overwork, and we actually create less results in the end than if we took the simple path. But simple is so hard because of all the noise out there. And so like you even see that in Content marketing itself, I was talking to an agency owner this week who uh, was going to have me train his network of agency owners, people that want to build an agency. And he's like, you know, the main problem is shiny object syndrome. If they hear about content marketing, but they haven't done the first steps of building their business, they might jump to content marketing before they've done those steps, whereas they should be doing less work and focus on the right steps. And that was such a good point. So it was like, when do we introduce this tool to them? When do we augment their lives and get them tons of traffic? Are they ready for that traffic? So I think like slowing down and thinking of your next step versus just trying to get it all done and overworking. That's where the hustle culture can be detrimental to success because you forget that simple is what sells in the end. But that said, I am a big fan of hard work and it's why you'll see me sometimes working 10 hour days without shame because <laughs> I believe that's what it takes to get ahead. One of the best mentors I've ever been trained by sold a business for close to 300 million and is retired in England off the grid fully, not even on social media anymore. <laughs> Tell me, uh, this is like seven years ago. He's like, Julia, you know, it all comes down to people that outwork the competition. But the cool thing is you can outwork with AI without outworking yourself. It's like, you know, our content and our traffic is a case study to that. So yep. that's where I would end. Um, I, I want to edit what AI said. <laughs> I can't <laughs> <be so bad. laughs> Terrible. <laughs> Don't be lazy. I just want to add a little bit to what you said there because uh, something that I've been like, this year for me is all about using AI to kind of just like amplify everything. I'm looking at it for like all aspects of my life. And uh, I'm also incorporating stuff like um, uh, it's the 12 week. There's a book called the 12 week year um, that I found really, really fascinating how to view your year in, the, in a span of, of 12 weeks and how you should compress the amount of time that you really think a year is and kind of focus on the, just the core main objectives, the objectives that you have. 
but then breaking that down even further into what are the three core aspects of your day that if you just complete those and you simplify your entire agenda around those three, um, how that simplicity will actually enable you to com to complete your tasks and your most impactful tasks a lot faster and a lot with a lot more clarity without a lot of distraction. So kind of push everything else out, focus on the three for the day, and then focus on that kind of 12, those 12 weeks, and then you just repeat that process throughout the year. And I thought it was really, really interesting. And then incorporating the, obviously AI with that. Um, so yeah, print 24 is looking really, really interesting. Mm, yes. I love it, Jeff. I can go to you and I'm like, okay, what's our content marketing strategy for LinkedIn? And you're like, let me build an AI agent and content at scale for that. And then like a day later, the agent's deployed. I spent uh, probably about 11 hours yesterday just on like LinkedIn agents, <laughs> wow. just laser focus on trying to perfect it. So yeah, I mean, sometimes you just get really into it and you, you, have, to, you have to run with it, you know, yes. get the idea out. Yes. And that deep focus state produces great results. Mm -hmm. Well, we can go ahead and wrap up. I think um, this is a good note to wrap up on. Don't forget to subscribe to this episode or the podcast to catch more episodes on AI and the future of how AI will impact work as we know it, content as we know it, marketing as we know it, literally everything as we know it, <laughs> including our dreams. <laughs> <laughs> There's a headset out there and it helps you dream better. That's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so you can find Future Tense wherever you listen to podcasts, and whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Player FM. We are literally on every streaming platform. And if we're not, let us know. Email Jeff at continentscale.ai, Julia at continentscale.ai. Email us with questions, thoughts, feedback. We'd love to address them on the show. So if there is something you've seen in the, in the news that's affecting you, your work, tell us about it. If there's a guest you want to see on our show, we're planning out our first 100 guest. That's something we'll take as well, your suggestions. So until then, thank you for listening. And we'll see you on the next episode where it'll be just Jeff. I'm just kidding. Womp womp. <laughs> <laughs> no, it'll be good. I promise. <laughs> All right. All right bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>